praise God. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. He's worthy. Give him praise. Come on, give God some praise. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. We give God the praise. You may be seated. We thank God for the opportunity to be here this morning to share with you from the word of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad to see you this morning. Come on, look at somebody else and say, I'm glad to see you. Amen. You might as well find a third person and say, it's good to see you. Praise God. We, of course, give honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is indeed our Lord God and Savior. We honor our Apostle David Kenny and his bride, Prophet Patricia Kenny, we honor the leadership of this great church, our pastors David and Surrender Flanagan and all of the other elders and the ministers in their respective places. We give God praise for them. This morning we just feel that God is requiring of us. Somebody say, Zion is calling me to what? A higher place of praise. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. So before we go any further, we have given honor to God. We have honored Apostle Kenny and the leadership. We want to make sure that we touch God through worship. We want to worship him. We have excellent musicians anointed, every one of them. Wonderful worship and praise leaders. But we are going to worship God for ourselves. Somebody say amen. Amen. So let's just for three minutes... You can stand, you can sit, whichever comfortable position you can assume, and just worship God. I didn't say sing, I said worship God. Just open your mouth. Thank Him for all that He is to us. Not so much all that He has done for us, but all that He is to us. He's our Savior. Yes, Lord. He's our Counselor. He's our mighty God. Mighty God. He's our Prince of, Peace. Prince of Peace. He's our Everlasting Father. Every day He's a Father to us. He is the glory and the lifter of our heads. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus. He's the healer of our bodies. Jesus. He's the provider of our lives. We worship him. We magnify him. We exalt him today. Hallelujah. Oh God, we bless you. We worship you. You are our God and we adore you. You are our king and we honor you. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you all of the majesty. All praise is due unto your name. Worship belongs to you. Oh, God, we worship and adore you. Come on, we got two more minutes to just worship him. Hallelujah. Two more minutes to just lift our hands and lift our voices in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to 
Thank you. This morning we will be coming from Just the musician, you may leave. portion of scripture found in the Pauline epistle, the epistle written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Thessalonica, the first letter that he wrote to them, 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, reading from the ninth through the twelfth verses, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 12. I would be reading from the Amplified Bible. You can follow whatever version you're in, but I just wanted to let you know if it sounds differently from your version, it's because I'm coming from a particular version, namely the Amplified Bible. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 12, when you found it, say amen. It reads like this. 
Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you have been, in parentheses, personally taught by God to love one another. Parentheses again says that is to have an unselfish concern for others and to do things for their benefit. Verse 10, for indeed you already do practice it toward all the believers throughout Macedonia, in parentheses, by actively displaying your love and concern for them. But we urge you, brothers and sisters, that you excel, in parentheses again, in this matter, more and more. Verse 11, and to make it your ambition to live quietly and peacefully and to mind your own affairs and work with your hands just as we directed you. Verse 12, lastly, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders, in parenthesis, exhibiting good character, personal integrity, and moral courage worthy of the respect of the outside world. And be dependent on no one and in need of nothing. Parenthesis lastly, be self-supporting. We have word, read the word of God. We will indeed, there's a fancy word that they use these days called a pericope, which simply means the focal point. We know it as the text. The text of this particular scriptural reading is found in the 11th verse, and it states again, and to make it your ambition to live quietly and peaceably, and to mind your own affairs and work with your hands just as we directed you. For a subject, look at your neighbor and say, love me. Don't be afraid of them. Open your mouth and say, love me. But don't try to control me. Look at somebody else and say, please don't control me. And say that that's loving me. Find a third person and say, you can love somebody without controlling them. We pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word, for it is indeed divine, eternal truth. Even now, O oh God, help us to not only hear the truth, but help us to live the truth that we have heard. That we will not only be hearers, but doers as well. We pray this, O oh God, as we go forth, that your word will become flesh within us, that we may flesh it out, that we may, through life applicational action, put it into practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, look at somebody and say, love me, but don't control me. Why are we preaching this? We are in an age. We are in, we are living in a time where 
Words are being thrown around. Words like love. Words like I am in a relationship. Words like love and relationship. Being loosely thrown around. Now what does this have to do with the body of Christ? Several centuries ago, the Apostle Paul had to address the love issue within the Thessalonican church. In his first letter to them, which we know as First Thessalonians, in the fourth chapter from verses 9 through 12, as we have read, we found out that there was something going on there concerning love. Now, what I want to do real quickly is help us, Brother Thad, to understand that God is love. Let me say it slowly for the fellow at the back. God is love. But love is not God. Again, slowly for the sister in the middle. God is love, but love is not God. What are we saying? We're simply saying that we are living in a society where they have taken the stance and they have made something that is not God, God. But subtly, they have done it. It's not very discernible. It's not very detectable if you're not paying attention. They indeed call things by a name that does not agree with the action that they are performing. So let me go real quick. Tell somebody in a relationship. There are three things that you got to adhere to. Building a foundation because we're going somewhere. When you marry Lula Bell, and Lula Bell marry Daquan, both Daquan and Lula Bell need to understand these three things for this relationship to work. I am taking a human interpersonal relationship and using it as an example to help us understand a spiritual principle. Look at somebody and say, we're looking at the natural to understand the spiritual. The first thing Daquan and Lula Bell got to understand is that in a love relationship, you cannot control people. Let us sink in. You could try, but it's not going to work. God is love and God does not control people. God has given everyone a free will. So what makes us think that we are greater than God and we can control people? People will say, no, I'm not trying to control Lula Bell. No, I'm not trying to control Daquan. So why you are remotely seeking to direct their every step? Meaning... If Daquan leaves the house and goes around the corner, he got to call you 15 times before he gets back. Y'all don't all scream at the same time. We want to know where he is every five minutes. You cannot control, try it. You can't control your children.
In a relationship, you can only control the things within, it's, it's an oxymoronical statement, within your own control. That's why the Bible even tells us that we must have the fruit of the Spirit. One of the cluster of the fruit of the Spirit is temperance or self-control. Look at your neighbor and say, you need God. To control yourself. God has to by his spirit empower us to control ourselves. So the first thing, you can control people. People are going to do what they want to do. With or without your attempt to control them. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going somewhere. The second thing we need to understand, Lula Bell and Daquan, not only you can't control each other, but you cannot fix or change each other. In a relationship, that is me and you, boy. You can't fix or change a person. I don't care how anointed you are, how intelligent you are. You cannot fix or change anybody. Look at your neighbor and say, only God can fix me. Only God can change me. Watch this. The third thing real quickly. First thing, you can't control. Second thing, you can fix a change. Now, this is the biggie. And I know I'm in the presence of psychological excellence and sapiential wisdom in the personage of Prophet Patricia Kenny. <laughs> Listen to me. You cannot exclusively own somebody in a relationship. What am I saying? Before you got into the relationship with Daquan, Daquan had a mama and a daddy and a sister and a brother and an auntie and an uncle and cousins. and There were preceding relationships in Daquan's life before Lula Bell showed up. With her fly cell. All right. You cannot marry Lula Bell and tell her that she can't hang out and go on a girl's trip. Negro, please. <laughs> you cannot exclusively own her for yourself. She had a life before you. Amen. She has a life with you. And God knows it's the truth. If you close your eyes in eternal sleep, she going to have a life after you. Amen. You can't own her. Tell the fellow under the chair, wake up and say amen. Why are we teaching this? Because the Thessalonians had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. They wanted to show love their style. The first thing we find in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 11 is that they were told to indeed have an ambition to be quiet. Why is this? Historically, as we look in antiquity and history, we find that the Thessalonian church was zealous in the area of love. We even read it in, in verse 9. They loved everybody. Verse 10 said they loved everybody in Macedonia. They were a European church. Apostle and pastor and just came back from East Africa. They were not an African church. They were a European church. Tell somebody, culture and ethnicity 
is significant. In this European church that just got the gospel, remember the Gentiles. Tell somebody, Europeans are Gentiles. According to the word of God. If you black and you're not saved, darling, you're not a Gentile, you're black. I'm going to hell. But if you are a European, that's a Gentile. The Gentiles were referred to the people in Europe. When the man came in the vision and said to Paul, come over to Macedonia and help us. That's when the gospel left Africa. I know you know it as the Middle East, but learn your geography. The Middle East is a European geographical terminology for geopolitical reasons. It was never called the Middle East. Look at where it's attached. And you know, y'all can get it on your way home. So the thing is, when Jesus and his mother and father, according to humanity, Joseph and Mary, left and ran away from Herod, they didn't run to downtown Oslo, Sweden. They ran to Egypt. Where is Egypt? Good, all right. And they fit in. Y'all, they can sink in. So anyhow, you want to call your blonde hair, blue eye baby to Africa and fit in? <laughs> oh, anyhow, but here it is. When the gospel left Africa and went to Europe, when you take a concept from one geographical environment to another, you have to go through social and linguistic shifting. There's a reason why I'm preaching this. You cannot treat the people in Macedonia the same way you treat the people in Africa. It's different cultures. You cannot communicate with them. You cannot interact with them the same way. Say, hey, what happened? When the Thessalonians got the gospel, they began to love in a way that they already knew how to love. But the problem was not with their intention, which is love. That's a good intention. But it was with their delivery. The manner in which they expressed the love. Let me give you an example. They would go into the other churches in Macedonia. And say listen we love you. You're wrong. Do it like us. Do you all know people like that? Yeah. Ah. And they're not from Thessalonica. <laughs> say here it is. This church, I come here to say this, this church is getting ready to go through a paradigm shift. God is, don't worry, seats don't excite me. Empty or full. Let me say this. God is getting ready to bring some people in this ministry that never came to a ministry like this in their lives. Watch this. And we got to understand who they are by letting them know we love them, but we can't love them the way that Christian growth is accustomed to loving one another. It works for Christian growthites, but it's not going to work for these new people. We're going to have to go an extra mile. With a, somebody say amen. We gonna have so hear this. Paul told them, "I know you love the churches, but I want you to do it more effectively. Study." That's what the King James said. To be quiet. It means have an ambition to not let your culture be superimposed upon these. 
converts in the other churches that you're trying to win for Christ. Don't go to the other churches and say, do praise and worship just like us. Have a choir just like us. Usher just like us. People got different expressions of praise. You know why I'm preaching this? Because I just got through dealing with all kinds of excitement with the churches that I oversee. All kinds of new situations. We, anyway, I, I, it's not about me. Here what happened. We have to be sensitive to the target audience with whom we are dealing. Look at your neighbor and say, they called an apostle to preach. So you will get an apostolic message. I am not here to make you feel nice or good. I am here to agitate change. Look at somebody and say, we get it ready to shift. Touch that brother who is sleeping and say, wake up brother, we shift him. <laughs> Apostle Kenny, Prophet Kenny, Pastor, Surrender Pastor David, went away not because they wanted a vacation. They went away because it is their custom to obey the mandate of this ministry. Go ye into all the world. Tell somebody church culture. The church culture of Christian growth is not unique. It came from somewhere else. Apostle Kenny and I grew up, and, and Sister Sh Sh um, Sh Chandra, grew, grew up in a church in Brooklyn where missions was a part of the church culture. Do you know that we were horrified and shocked when we came to Atlanta, Georgia to find out that that was a foreign thing to most black churches? I'm serious. We thought everybody was doing it. Tell somebody church culture shock. The Thessalonians had a culture shock where they thought that everybody should be doing things the way they did it. Even if it was right, there's a way to introduce it to the people that you don't discourage them or turn them off. Now hear what happened. Paul said to them, make it your ambition to not promote yourself in the process. Have you ever met some Christians who go to what used to be called mega churches? The pandemic has eradicated the mega church culture. Before the pandemic, people were coming into churches by rote, like robots, and were caught up in the ambiance, the building, the smoke machine, the dimming of the lights, the, the music. Okay. But when the pandemic came, we couldn't go in a building. So you were in your little bunny slippers and a robe, and you're looking at Zoom. So you can't worry about the ambiance anymore. You have to pay attention to the message. And as you're paying attention to the message, Pastor uh, Surrender, you realize that this man or this woman that you've been going to hear all this time in this wonderful building with the smoke machine and all that. They ain't saying nothing. But the smoke machine had you going, the lights and thing, and the ooh, dim the light, turn on the light, dim the light. Oh, it was wild. Wild. But they weren't saying anything. So when you remove the veneer, when you remove the smoke and the whistles and the thing, you have the message. And you got to pay attention. And you realize this guy ain't saying anything. And you scroll through and you find on Facebook Live a woman, a man, preaching the truth. But they didn't have a large ministry. But you couldn't know 
because everybody on Zoom. Big, small, and medium were on Zoom and Facebook. You couldn't discern the size. They they, they before account. And content of message became important. And people start making decisions. I rather get the word of God than Christian cosmetic praise. That's praise with more parliament and funkadelic. That does the aging in dating. You, you, you know. You know what I mean? Whoa. You know? What are we saying? We must learn. I'm not preaching to any other church. That's a 330. We must learn to love people. I can remember, and I'm not going to look at him because I'm an emotional person. Apostle Kenny taught us years ago about agape love. Oh, y'all remember. Agape love don't make people feel inferior as you're giving it to them. That's what the Thessalonians were doing. Oh, oh, y'all are so backward. Oh, God, come, come, put the, put the mic down. This is how we do it. I love you. <laughs> it don't work. It don't work. So he said, do it quietly. Do it peaceably. Do it gently. In their enthusiasm, they were like a bull in a china shop, rushing in to fix everybody's lives. The people God is getting ready to send to our churches are jacked up. They don't even know how to spell church, much less know a move of God. They're vaping. They're pierced in every orifice of their body. They, they, they tattooed out in and across. They, they got some strange reasoning, all kinds of stuff. But they are souls. And they're coming looking for Jesus. Let's give them Jesus without seasoning up Jesus with our personality. Jesus is not Jason Owen Jesus. He is Jesus Christ, God the Son, all by himself. When we teach the word of God, when we go to Africa, when we go to Thailand, when we go to it's like we're in a different world because the people are not concerned about if Jesus had a Bentley. They're concerned about if Jesus loves them. They're concerned if Jesus has the power to heal them. This is what they're concerned about. Not the cosmetic Christianity. So he told them, love without imposing your personality on the people you love. Ladies, and I'm just talking to the ladies now, the sisters. How many of you like to go out with a man that would not shut up? He keeps talking about himself all through the evening. I did this, I went here, I have that, I did that, I did that. And you feel a shut up anointing coming upon you. <laughs> but he swears he loves you. He is trying to impress you, not with the love that is in his heart for you, but with himself. Well, that's what the Thessalonians were doing. They were trying to impress the other churches with the Thessalonian way and not with the love of God. But they swore they were loving those churches. Anybody getting what I'm saying today? The second thing Paul told them. Not only have an ambition to be quiet and 
normal and not crazy, but also mind your own affairs. Let me come down because I don't like standing over. Watch this. Minding your own affairs is a nice way of saying mind your own business. The Thessalonian church was so bent on getting involved with so-called helping people that they forgot to attend to their own affairs. Nice. Want to know how long? Oh, mm, oh you know, and they get in the spirit. Ooh, you know, you know. And they look the spooky. And the eyes. You know, it's all kind of thing. God showing them. Mm, what's your name? You know, come on, it's Patricia. You know, and they go through them. And then they start saying, I see something wrong with your marriage. Meanwhile, back home, where they're living, is a mess. But God forget about that and God is showing them everybody else. Oh, your husband don't love you. Oh, 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 and that kind of foolishness. They're bending up, somebody got to pick them up. It's foolishness. So I'm just saying, the Thessalonian church was in everybody else's business. Now there's a reason I preach in this. I ain't calling names. I ain't looking at nobody. I just preaching the truth. In the church today, mother, there are too many prophets who all they're doing is interfering with people's private lives. They're looking at your Facebook posts. Why you always smiling? Why you always having a good time? You know you sinning. Look at you. Oh, the devil is the lie. Look at you. Look at me. You know, unfoolishness. Watch this. The Thessalonian church, sadly though, felt that that's what God wanted them to do. God has not ordained any man or any woman to interfere with the personal private lives of his people. That is called witchcraft. Not sorcery. Sorcery is making potions. But witchcraft is intimidation, manipulation, and domination. I intimidate you first. By making you feel that I'm so holy and I always in the presence of the Lord. Every minute God showing me something. Oh yes, you know. I, I, ooh, everybody get intimidated. Then I come and I manipulate you. To manipulate somebody. Somebody say manus. Pulation. Han. Manus. Manual. Manual labor. Han. So manipulation means, and, and pulation means Pollution, polluting you with my hands. Where I get my hands in your life and try to take you outside of God's purpose for your life and make you serve my purpose for my life. Manipulation. Manipulation is making people do things that they normally would not do. But they are so intimidated and afraid of you they're doing it. Domination belongs to God's people. God said to Adam and Eve that they should have what? Dominion. But not the kind of dominion the devil promotes. The devil kind of dominion is where they want to control your every move. There are churches, and I ain't calling nobody name. That if you want to buy a car, you got to check with the prophet first. No, I'm serious. That is domination. So here what happened. He said to them, mind your own affairs. Mind your own business. 
Don't get so much in everybody else's business. You helping over here? You helping? Wives, and I ain't looking at no woman. Don't get so busy saving the community, the world, this one, the other one, and ignoring your husband. This is for free. God called me to, to do You ain't cooking, you ain't cleaning, you look like Aunt Jemima on a bad day. Your bread is so stink that when you open your mouth, flies die. You think about one, let me be here. <laughs> you know, but, you know, but I'm saying to you, don't get so busy. You know, there's a wise man. You should be teaching people about missions. Going to, I'm serious. You should be, I mean, like, you got the platform. You, you should be teaching some people who, anyhow, we're tough. Look, watch this. He taught me, oh, for those who don't know, this is my spiritual father, right? Now, here what happened. He taught me, don't try to help other people at the expense of helping yourself. He taught me that helping others must not only make sense to them, it must make sense to you. Let me tell you what I mean. How can I help you if I'm broke? He taught me kingdom economics. How can I help you if I am not taking care of my own business? The Thessalonian church, if you read in verse 12, was told, don't depend on anybody. Work with your own hands that you will not have to be begging. Begging. Do you know what is the greatest dilution of anointing? A false balance. What's a false balance? I am very anointed, but I'm very broke. That's false. How, no, no, I'm serious. How can people follow me? Now, I, I'm sorry to say these things, and if I'm wrong, he will correct me. You cannot... Lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You powerful. And at the end you say, all right, did you get healed? Yes. Give me five dollars for gas. There are too many men and women of God begging the people that they're leading for money. Ah, Maria, you think you could give me twenty dollars until next week? That don't Correlate. It don't go together. People want to see you be the first partaker of the message that you're preaching. If you're preaching that God is a God of prosperity, guess what they want to see you doing? Prospering. I didn't say they want to see you with a Bentley and a private jet, but for God's sake, they want to see you not under the bridge. You, you know, uh, uh, anyhow. So, so the thing is, the Thessalonian church and this church is, is, is getting a parallel from it. God has blessed our leader with wisdom. He is not begging. He worked very hard at transit. So when he retired, he got a higher salary than he was making because he worked a lot of over. Do you know the, the, the system that we did? You know what he was thinking about? Not then, but in the future. When you retire, you don't want to be standing in the doorway of Walmart saying welcome. You understand? Or let me check them bags. You know what I'm saying? You all and checking bags. You can't even see. You know, I'm a Negro. I mean, what are you doing? They said, God bless. You know, listen, listen. 
Mind your, look at somebody and say, mind your own affairs. Mind your own affairs. There's a reason why I'm doing this. The temptation, Dr. Patricia, is when we see people in need, we get into savior mode. We have a messiah complex. And we give too much energy into trying to save these people from a life they were living long before we met them. And they're comfortable with it. And we're taking time out from our own necessary work to help them. Now, it's a trick that the devil plays on Christians. Do not leave your post at Christian growth because somebody in Conyers needs meals on wheels. So you, do, meals on wheels is a good thing, but you're supposed to be operating the camera. But you're not at the camera because you're busy serving meals on wheels. It happens. God does not want the needs of others to supersede his mandate upon our life. Let me say it slowly. God has called us to the lost. He called us to reach the lost. But he did not call us to reach the lost at the expense of staying in his will. We can be caught up in a Messiah complex trying to run all over the place helping people. And at the end of the day, we have nothing to show for ourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, if I don't take care of me, I can't take care of anybody. This is the closing thing. Three things. One, love without being braggadocious. Love without telling people, oh, you see that shirt that he's wearing? Oh, I gave it to him. Praise the Lord. Oh, you see, you see her hair and nails? Oh, yeah, I pay for her hair and nails. Oh, glory to God. Oh, you see that red shirt he has on? Just do it. And shut up. People don't need to know, oh, I have it. Yeah, you see how he happy now? Oh, he was horrible when I first met him. Uh, and I helped him. Oh, God, he was a man. Oh, drinking, cursing, and such. You know, sex, love, sick. sick, sick. But, you know, I, I help him. What are you doing? Just do it and shut up. That's the first thing. Have an ambition to be quiet and not broadcast what you're doing with the law. Second thing we just found out. Mind your own business before you try to help people with theirs. Because there's an influx of people that are getting ready to come into this church. Watch, you will see. That did not know the God that we grew up with. All right. The third thing. First thing. What was the first thing? Love with quietness. Lord, you know, have ambition. What was the second thing? Mind your own business. Now here the third thing. Work with your own hands. Now, Pastor David, this is where God dealt with me with this. I used to be an employee. Chandra used to be an employee. But then I became a contractor and a consultant. Because I realized that being an employee is a glorified way of being a slave. The employer is not paying the employee that the employee may prosper. The employer is paying the employee the way that you, how many of y'all like fishing? Like how people put bait on a hook for fish. Give the employee just enough to keep coming back to the job. 
So hear what happened. Working with your own hands, hear the interpretation. Somebody said, find a skill that God has already placed in you. And use it for the kingdom. You cannot bless God's kingdom without you receiving a blessing as well. You're not going into entrepreneurship so you could get fat. Now, there's a reason why we're dealing with this, Tara. We have encouraged people to be entrepreneurs in the church. Come on, y'all get your own business. God wants you to get your own business. And, and, and you'll be able to sow more into the kingdom. And initially, the people received it and said, yes, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to take care of my family. And I want to sow more into the kingdom. But you know what happened? The business started to interfere with kingdom business. Let us sink in. Initially, we were doing, we, look, we, we got this contract, that contract, and we thank God, and we're tithing, tithing, and we sowing, and we praise God, and God blessing our families, all kinds of things. But after a while, the business became God. It became our priority. And we legitimize it by saying, if I don't do this work, you know, I'm married to Beyonce, y'all, you know. Uh, Beyonce is not going to get to do her hair and nails, both pedicure and manicure. If I don't do this running around, I can't help with the new building for the ministry. God has not mandated that we single-handedly build his kingdom. Tell somebody, it's not by might, nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. The devil will trick us into thinking that we're being responsible entrepreneurs when indeed he is distracting us. From our kingdom assignment. Tell you a story before I pray with people. My first bride, Pastor Jill, um, you know, Janine, who went home to be the Lord. We were building Snellville Biblical Deliverance Center, and we needed worship and praise and whatnot. And the organist was not there. Well, you know, all of us were trained in music, all three sons, myself. And I started to play the Hammond B3 organ. Oh, yeah. Well, you make Tad look sick. I mean, <laughs> you know, I was, yeah, yeah. I mean, bad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was bad. Bad. You know what I mean? With my eyes closed. <laughs> It was great. And Pastor Janine said to me, thank you for helping. But you are called to be an apostle. But you get into wrapped up and tied up on the organ. It's a good thing you're doing, but that's not what you're called to do. You're helping, but that's not what you're called to do. And she said, get up and get off of that organ and be an apostle. Not because you're good at it. It means that God wants you to do it. Let me say it slowly. Yes, you're good. Yes, you're even blessing people. But that's not your calling. Oh, people depend on me. Yeah, yeah that's true. But God is depending on you as well. Now hear what I'm saying in closing. 
I ain't even got to tell you. Any. The thing is this. When you are bitten, tell somebody we're building Christian growth. Is that, and, and he not going to tell you. He's a nice man. Here it is. He is not going to, let, let me tell you all something. David went to war. His name is David. David went to war. You know, they were going David in the Bible. And they were fighting. And one of Goliath's brothers came and said, Uh-huh, I got you now. Because David was no longer the little boy with a sling. He was an older king. And David was tired. Tired. And the brother of Goliath, a giant, had a new sword and was going to kill David because David was tired. He couldn't fight anymore. And Abishai, a younger man, one of David's captains, came quickly and killed the giant and saved David's life. And hear what they said. They said, now listen, from today, you don't come out and fight with us anymore. Because we don't want to extinguish the light of Israel. This man here is the light of Christian growth. Don't let's kill him before this time. Let me say it in, in Spanish. I don't know because people looking at me like, listen, let's get up and do what we need to do. We got enough men and women in this building that this man could train you and don't have to worry about anything and have you doing what you got to do instead of him jumping off a plane Running up, straighten some chairs. No, no, no. You need, hello, to get in line. You see, there's a, and I, I like preaching as nice as I can. I teach in more than preaching. I'm here to encourage Christian growth. It's time to grow up and take responsibility. So we won't dim or out the light. Of Christian growth. Men. Let's work this thing. Let's get in our places. How many of y'all went to missions. In this building. You see what I'm saying. You see what I know I ain't crazy. Watch this. These men who put their hand up. To say they went to missions. Are not teenagers anymore. We need to avoid what happened after Joshua died. When Joshua died, there arose a generation that did not know the God of Joshua. We don't want, when people move on, Christian growth is full of people who don't know missions. How could you be in a mission-minded ministry and you ain't going on missions. Hello? So here it is. Just as Abib Chai said, listen, we are not going. This man, tired, came from Africa. Tired, he's still here. Some people probably didn't get the memo that he's here, so they didn't come. Let me say it in French. Some people, <laughs> what am I saying? Let us grow up and realize that this vision has provision. Let me explain, let me give you a new paradigm of the interpretation of provision. Provision for the vision. You either for the vision or you're not for the vision. Inactivity is activity by itself. You have chosen to do nothing. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to get up and get involved. Don't wait until the people come because they're coming. Don't wait until the people come to get yourself in position. Get yourself in position now that the people meet you in position. When people come to a church, they look to see what's going on. 
And if they see this beautiful sister here fighting this handsome brother here, they say, I don't want to be a part of them. But worse yet, if they see that the leader is pulling all of the weight and the people are doing nothing, they said, I don't want that condemnation on me. I don't want to be a part of that. We need, he said he never went on a sabbatical. We need to send him on a vacation. He's not going to ask you. Yeah, y'all can clap. Send him on a vacation. Not just him, but Pastor Patricia as well. Because it's a crazy thing with black churches. We love the leader, but we hate his wife. That's of the devil. I hope I could say these kinds of things. Oh, bless his name. Listen, 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 listen. I'm leaving this church. I don't know why he married her. Well, I'm saved. And he doesn't like me to use explicit delictive. That's a nice way of saying four letter word expression. You cannot love the leader and hate his bride. Let me say it in another language. Let me go over here because you can't claim to be for the leader and ignore his wife in the lobby. You can't pray for the leader and neglect to pray for his wife. You can't say, listen, no, no, uh, uh, David Kenny is my pastor and I, I don't know anybody named Patricia. That's the devil. They are what? One. <laughs> Hear this in the closing. How are we going to pray for people? How many of you want to flow in what God is getting ready to do? Meet me at the altar. We're going to flow with God. This man is looking for people who are turned on to the move of God. Y'all think I don't be watching. I watch the thing. Every, they, they give me the, what do you call the thing? The prompting with the, with the streaming. I listen to the messenger. Come, come to the altar if you want to be a part of what God is doing. We're not going to be long, I promise you. Come. Because we got to see, you see a lot of people are still in the screaming and the hollering business. But after you've screamed and you've hollered, what are you living? Come, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Real quick. Real quick. We're going to pray. I want you to know that none of us are in